derivatives and rates of change. From earlier lessons, we've talked about the slope of a secant line through two points on a function. So let's imagine we have a function f of x here. Point P is a fixed point and has coordinates a, f of a. And point Q is some other point on the function and its coordinates are x and f of x. If we want to find the slope of this tangent line, we would subtract the y values and subtract the x values and then divide those quantities. And so the slope of the secant line is f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. Now imagine that point Q is free to move on this function. So let's suppose point Q is over here. As point Q approaches point P, the secant lines that you get through PQ start to get closer and closer to this line, which is the tangent line. And so if we wish to find the slope of this tangent line, we are going to take the limit as x approaches a of the slope of the secant line. So basically what's happening down here on the x-axis is this number x is getting closer and closer to a, and as that happens, point Q gets closer and closer to P. And when you take the limit, you get the slope of the tangent line, provided that this limit exists. Find the equation of the tangent line to the parabola y equals x squared at the point P, which is 2, 4. So here I have a picture of the function y equals x squared. And then the point 2, 4 is a point on that parabola. And I went ahead and graphed the tangent line. So this is what the tangent line would look like. The question is, how do we find the equation of the tangent line? So let's remember that when you're looking for the equation of a line, you need two things. You need a point on the line, which we know. We know the point on our line is the point 2, 4. And we need the slope of the line. And this is what we don't know right now. But we do know the slope of this tangent line is given by the formula m equals limit x approaches a of f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. Now, first of all, some notation here. If I write y equals x squared for the purposes of this problem, I'm going to rename that function f of x. And now I can do this limit. So the slope of the tangent line will be the limit as x approaches 2, right? Because remember, a is the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. And then we're going to have f of x minus f of 2 divided by x minus 2. So basically, I just took this formula and I plugged in a equals 2. Now let's do the computations. So this will be the limit as x approaches 2. f of x is x squared. f of 2 is 4. And then divided by x minus 2. Now, if you just plug in 2, you are going to get 0 divided by 0. So instead, what we're going to do is factor the numerator, which turns out to be x minus 2 times x plus 2, and then factor the denominator. And now we notice that these factors cancel out. And this becomes the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2. And now to evaluate this limit, we can simply plug x equals 2 into our function. And so this becomes 2 plus 2, which is equal to 4. So now we know the slope of our tangent line is 4, and the point on our tangent line was 2, 4. And now to find the equation of the tangent line, 
I will use the point slope formula for a line and plug in what we know. And typically what we do when we get an equation of a line is we go ahead and multiply it out and then finally solve for y. And so we end up getting y equals 4x minus 4. And that is the equation of this line. We can talk about the slope of a tangent line in a slightly different way in terms of notation. So once again, let's say we have some function f of x, and we're going to call the x value here a. So this point is the same. It's a, f of a. But now for point q, instead of calling it x and f of x, what I'm going to do is define the x-coordinate of this point to be a plus h. So what I'm doing is taking our original x value of a, and I'm just adding h to it. So this point q has an x-coordinate of a plus h and a y-coordinate of f of a plus h. And now if I want to find the slope of this secant line, I would simply take the y value here, f of a plus h, minus the y value here, f of a, and then divided by the x value, a plus h, minus the x value of a. So the slope of the secant line can be expressed as f of a plus h minus f of a divided by a plus h minus a. And if we just simplify the denominator a little bit there, we can see that the a and the negative a cancel out, and this just becomes h. Now, if I want the slope of the tangent line, we have to make point Q approach point P. And as point Q approaches point P, this distance decreases. So this distance H goes to zero. And so the slope of the tangent line can be alternatively expressed as the limit as H goes to zero of F of A plus H minus F of A divided by H. And for many functions and examples, this formula will be the preferred formula. So pretty much from now on, I will use this formula to find the slope of a tangent line. For example, let's find an equation of the tangent line to the hyperbola y equals 3 divided by x at the point 3, 1. So here is the graph of 3 over x. It is this black function here. The point 3, 1 is the point of tangency. And I went ahead and drew the tangent line there. So we are looking for the equation of this tangent line. And for this problem, I'm going to use the new definition for the slope of the tangent line. So first of all, if y is equal to 3 over x, I'm going to rename this as f of x equals 3 over x. I know the point on the tangent line, of course, is the point 3, 1. And this means that a equals 3, because a is the x-coordinate of the point. And now to find the slope of the tangent line, we will take the limit as h goes to 0. And if you look at the formula here, we have f of a plus h. Now remember, for us, a is 3. So this is going to be f of 3 plus h minus f of 3, all divided by h. So the first thing we need to do here is we need to write down what is f of 3 plus h. Well, f of x is 3 divided by x. So if we have f of 3 plus h, we are plugging 3 plus h into here. So we get 3 divided by 3 plus h. So this becomes the limit as h goes to 0, 3 divided by 3 plus h minus f of 3. Well, we know that f of 3 is 1, right? You can also figure it out by plugging in 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. But it was given in the point of tangency. So we know that's 1. 
and then this is divided by h. Now, if you plug in h equals 0, you will get 0 divided by 0. So what I need to do here is multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by the least common denominator, which is 3 plus h. Doing this gives us the limit as h goes to 0. And remember now, we are going to multiply these together. And when I do that, the 3 plus h cancels out, and I just get 3 minus, and then we need to multiply 3 plus h to negative 1. And so that's going to be minus quantity 3 plus h. And then in the denominator, we have h times 3 plus h. Distribute the negative. We have the limit as h goes to 0, 3 minus 3 minus h. Same denominator. And now we're going to cancel out what we can. So 3 minus 3 cancels. And now we have negative h over h times 3 plus h. Now these h's cancel out. And we have the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 1 over 3 plus h. And now to find the limit, I can simply substitute h equals 0 into there. And that gives us negative 1 over 3 plus 0, which is negative 1 third. So now for the equation of the tangent line, we have a slope, which is negative 1 third. We have the point of tangency, which is 3, 1. And now I'll just use the point-slope form of a line. And this will give us y minus 1 equals negative 1 third times x. And then negative 1 third times negative 3 is positive 1. And then when I add 1 to both sides, we end up getting y equals negative 1 third x plus 2. And I'm sorry, I should have a plus 1 here. I said it correctly, but then I wrote plus 2. So here is the equation of the tangent line. And you can actually verify that this is the correct equation. Because if you look at the tangent line, it does have a y-intercept of 2. So that's the point 0, 2. And you can see the slope of the tangent line is negative 1 third. Right? So we can actually verify that this is the correct equation of the tangent line by looking at that graph. The instantaneous velocity of an object with position function f of t at time t equals a is notated by v of a, so that is the velocity at a, equals the limit as h goes to 0, f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. So I want you to notice that the instantaneous velocity, which means the velocity at an instant, is the same as the slope of the tangent line to the position function. So if we have a position function here, the slope of a secant line between two points is the average velocity. If we take the limit as h goes to 0, that becomes the instantaneous velocity. So again, the secant line the slope there gives you the average velocity over a time period. But at a particular point, the slope of the tangent line gives you the instantaneous velocity, which means the velocity at that instant. So not only is this formula useful for finding the equation of a tangent line, it's also the instantaneous velocity when your function represents the position of some object. So in this next example, suppose that a ball is dropped from the upper observation deck of the CN Tower, 450 meters above ground. What is the velocity of the ball after five seconds? Well, we know the velocity is given by this formula. And in particular, we want the velocity after 5 seconds. So we really want v of 5. And so if we let a equal 5, this formula becomes the limit as h goes to 0, f of 5 plus h minus f of 5 divided by h. 
So now to compute this limit, we just need to know what is f of 5 plus h and what is f of 5. Well, the function is given here. The position is 4.9 times t squared. So if that's f of t, f of 5 plus h will be 4.9 times 5 plus h to the second power. And this is 4.9 times 25 plus 10h plus h squared. So I just foiled there. And then f of 5 is going to be 4.9 times 5 squared. And this is 4.9 times 25. So now let's take these two quantities and plug them into the velocity formula. So the velocity after 5 seconds will be the limit as h goes to 0. f of 5 plus h is 4.9 times the quantity 25 plus 10h plus h squared minus f of 5 is 4.9 times 25, all divided by h. Now you might notice that I did not multiply 4.9 times 25. I did that just to avoid doing the computation there, but what I can do now is I can actually factor that out because I have a 4.9 in both terms there. So I have 4.9 multiplied by, and then 25 plus 10h plus h squared minus 25. Okay, and so that minus 25 is coming from here. And then all divided by h. And now you can see that the 25 and the negative 25 cancel out. And in addition, what I can do now is I have an h here and I have an h here. Let's go ahead and factor out that h. So I have 4.9 times h multiplied by 10 plus h divided by h. And now we can see that the h here cancels out, and this becomes the limit as h goes to 0, 4.9 times 10 plus h. And now it's safe to just allow h to equal 0. And what we get, of course, is 4.9 times 10, which is 49, and this will be meters per second. And this is the velocity at 5 seconds. Now, another way that we could have approached this problem, and I actually prefer to approach the problem in this way, is that rather than plug in a equals 5 in the beginning, which is what I did in all this work, is let's just go ahead and use the general formula for the velocity, and then plug 5 in in the end. So let's go through that procedure and see what it's like. So in this case, I'm just going to calculate V of A as it's written here. So to do this, I need to know what is F of A plus H. And so in this case, I'm just plugging A plus H in for T. So 4.9 times A plus H squared. And this can be multiplied out to be 4.9 times a squared plus 2ah plus h squared. And then f of a, of course, is just replacing t with a. So that just becomes 4.9 times a squared. So now v of a is the limit as h goes to 0. 4.9 times a squared plus 2ah plus h squared minus 4.9 times a squared divided by h. Now the next step is very similar to what I did before. I am going to factor out the 4.9 here, since that is a common factor. And when I do that, I have a squared plus 2ah plus h squared minus a squared. And now we can see the a squared and the negative a squared cancel out. And like previously, we have an h that we can factor out, and so this becomes the limit as h goes to 0 of 4.9h times 2a plus h divided by h. Next, the h cancels out, 
and we get the limit as h goes to 0 of 4.9 times 2a plus h. And now I can finish this limit by simply substituting h equals 0 into here. So this gives us 4.9 times 2a plus h, excuse me, plus 0, because h is now 0. And this is 4.9 times 2a, and that is 9.8 times a. So now we know the velocity at any time a is 9.8 times a. So if I want the velocity at 5 seconds, it's 9.8 times 5, which is 49 meters per second. So this is kind of nice because now we actually have a formula for finding the velocity at any value of a. Let's answer the second part of the question. So let's remember that v of a is 9.8a. And the second question asks, how fast is the ball traveling when it hits the ground? OK, so we need to know when it hits the ground, t is equal to what? How long does it take for the ball to hit the ground? So let's remember that the tower is 450 meters tall. And the position that the ball travels is given by 4.9 times t squared. So it is going to hit the ground when the position of the ball, or the distance traveled, is 450 meters. So we need to figure out when is s equal to 450 meters. But s is 4.9 times t squared. So we need to solve this for t. We can do that by dividing by 4.9. And when we divide by 4.9, we will get t squared is equal to 450 divided by 4.9. I'm going to go ahead and just use a calculator to approximate that. This gives us about 91.8367 seconds. And so t will be the square root of this number. And if we take the square root of that number, and I'm just going to round that to two decimal places, this is 9.6 seconds. Okay. So when the ball is dropped, it takes 9.6 seconds to hit the ground. So now we need to ask, how fast is the ball traveling when it hits the ground? And for this, we'll use our velocity formula. So the velocity at 9.6 seconds is going to be 9.8 times 9.6. So all we need to do now is multiply 9.8 times 9.6. And this is approximately 94.08 meters per second. So that's traveling pretty fast. That is, I'm guessing that is approximately 300 feet per second, so the ball is traveling very fast when it hits the ground. Now let's take a look at a series of examples where we are just finding f prime of a. And the focus for these next three examples is just how to perform the algebraic manipulation that needs to be done to compute each of these. So I have the formula here for reference, f prime of a. Here's the definition. So for this problem, we have f of t is equal to t cubed minus 3t. So if I want to find f prime of a, I need to know what is f of a plus h. So let's go ahead and calculate that. f of a plus h is a plus h to the third power minus 3 times a plus h. Now to do this, we have to multiply out a plus h by itself three times. And then, of course, we distribute here and get minus 3a minus 3h. But the vast majority of the work is multiplying these out. So the way I'm going to do this is multiply these two together first. So this gives me a plus h 
times a squared plus a h, excuse me, plus 2 a h plus h squared. And then now I'm going to multiply a to every term here and h to every term here, and then combine like terms. So when we multiply this out, we get a cubed plus 2a squared h plus a h squared plus a squared h plus 2a h squared plus h cubed. And we can combine like terms, 2a squared h and 1a squared h are like terms, and that's going to give us 3a squared h. And then a h squared plus 2a h squared is plus 3a h squared plus h cubed minus 3a minus 3h. So this is the simplified version of f of a plus h. And notice that I'm doing this before I plug it into the formula. Now we also need f of a, but f of a is very simple. f of a is simply replacing t with the letter a. And so that is a cubed minus 3a. So now we're just going to plug this expression and this expression into here and here. And so f prime of a becomes the limit as h goes to 0. a cubed plus 3a squared h plus 3a h squared plus h cubed minus 3a minus 3h minus the quantity a cubed minus 3a all divided by h. Let's see what we can do here. Well, if I distribute the negative, so if I do negative to the a cubed and negative here, we're going to get a negative and a positive. So let's go ahead and make that change. And after doing that, we can cancel a cubed and negative a cubed and negative 3a and positive 3a. And out of what is left in the numerator, which is all of these terms, notice that all those terms have an h in them. And so I can factor out the h, giving us 3a squared plus 3ah plus h squared minus 3, all divided by h. And the h's cancel out. And... Now we have the limit as h goes to 0, 3a squared plus 3ah plus h squared minus 3. And we can complete this limit now by simply substituting h equals 0. And when we do that, we get 3a squared plus 3a times 0 plus 0 squared minus 3. And of course, these two terms equal 0. And so we get 3a squared minus 3. In this next example, again, we would want to find f prime of a, given the function x divided by 1 minus 4x, and we are going to use the same definition for f prime of a. So first thing we need to do is figure out what is f of a plus h. So to get f of a plus h, we need to replace x with a plus h. Now when, when you replace x with a plus h in the denominator, make sure you put parentheses around it. And then let's go ahead and multiply out those parentheses. So this becomes 1 minus 4a minus 4h. And that's pretty much all we can do with that. And then f of a is just the function replacing x with a. So here are my two expressions, f of a plus h and f of a. Now let's substitute those into the formula. So this becomes the limit as h goes to 0. So I should be writing uh, f prime of a equals the limit h goes to 0. a plus h divided by 1 minus 4a minus 4h minus a over 1 minus 4a. And then don't forget, all divided by h. 
Now, there are different ways to algebraically simplify this expression. The method that I prefer to use is to multiply the numerator of the big fraction and the denominator of the big fraction by the least common denominator of these two fractions. So I'm going to multiply by 1 minus 4a minus 4h times 1 minus 4a to the top. And I'm going to multiply by that same expression to the bottom. Now, when you multiply this out, temporarily it's going to get really long. And I'm only going to write this down one time, but I, I want you to see it at least once. But we are going to take this expression and multiply it to the first fraction minus this expression multiplied to the second fraction. So when I do that multiplication, here is the expression that we get. So you can see we've multiplied this expression to the first fraction and that expression to the second fraction. Now here is why we do this. Let's keep in mind that we could put over one on each of these if it helps you see things. And we can also put parentheses around these denominators but the basic principle is that this denominator cancels here and this denominator cancels here. And so now what we have left is the limit as h goes to 0. We have a plus h multiplied by 1 minus 4a. So I'm just multiplying these two things together because that's all that's left. Then minus we have a multiplied by this 1 minus 4a minus 4h. In the denominator, it's very important that you not multiply anything out. Leave the denominator in factored form. You'll see why in just a minute here. So now we need to multiply out these parentheses and these parentheses very carefully. Also make sure you distribute the negative to each of these terms. And so when you do that, you get the following. And now let's see what we can cancel. Positive a and negative a cancel out. Negative 4ah, positive 4ah cancel out. Positive 4a squared, negative 4a squared cancels out. So almost everything in the numerator cancels out, but we do have an h left over. And that h that's left over is very important because one thing that should always happen when you do these problems correctly is this h in the denominator must cancel out with an h in the numerator. And then let's not forget that we have a 1 in front of that h. So this becomes the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over 1 minus 4a, excuse me, 1 minus 4a minus 4h times 1 minus 4a. And now to finish this limit, I am simply going to allow h to equal 0. And when you plug in 0 here, this is just going to cancel away. And so we are going to get 1 over 1 minus 4a times 1 minus 4a. And this is 1 over 1 minus 4a to the second power. And that is f prime of a. And for our third example, we are going to do the same thing, find f prime of a. This time they give you the additional information that a is equal to 1. So that means we are going to find f prime of a. And then when we're done, we will plug in a equals 1. So the procedure is the same. We need to first find f of a plus h which is going to be 1 divided by the square root of 2 times a plus h plus 2. And I can simplify this a little bit by multiplying out the parentheses 2a plus 2h plus 2. And of course, f of a is just 1 over the square root of 2a plus 2. So just like the previous two examples, we are going to plug these expressions in to our formula here, and we get f prime of a is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 
1 over the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2 minus 1 over the square root of 2a plus 2, and this is all divided by h. So we have to figure out how to simplify this expression. And it's very similar to the last problem in that the first step that I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the least common denominator, which is the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2. So this is exactly what we did in the previous problem. Now, I'm not going to show all of the steps in between here. So let's go ahead and just fast forward to what happens when I multiply this times this. Um, let's go ahead and write all that down. Okay, we're back. Here it is. It's all written out. And now what happens is this will cancel out and this will cancel out. And we end up with the limit, as h goes to 0, of the square root of 2a plus 2 minus the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2. And don't forget, you also need to multiply this to the denominator. But we don't actually have to do anything there. We're just going to write it down next to the h. Okay, so it seems like we're home free, but actually we're not. If you let h equal 0 right now, you will still get 0 divided by 0. So because we have this radical expression here, we now need to multiply by the conjugate of that radical. And so the conjugate of that radical looks like this. And we have to multiply at the top and the bottom. And it should be a plus sign. Sorry about that. Right, the conjugate is the opposite sign, as you see there, so these should be plus signs. Okay, so now we are going to multiply this times this, and in the denominator, you are not going to multiply anything. You're going to write this down next to this. So let's go ahead and do this work here. So limit h goes to 0. When you multiply the square root of 2a plus 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2, you get 2a plus 2. Now, the beauty of multiplying by a conjugate is I can skip multiplying the outside terms together and multiplying the inside terms together because those cancel out. So instead, I can just jump to multiplying the last terms together. So a negative times a positive is a negative, and the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2 is 2a plus 2h plus 2. Denominator is the same, and now it's also multiplied by this. All right, now in the numerator, just to save a little bit of time here, I am going to distribute this negative. So all of these are going to become negative. So let's go ahead and rewrite that. And now we can see 2a minus 2a cancels, 2 minus 2 cancels, and all I have left on top is a negative 2h. Now just to save us a little bit of time here, since all of this is gone, this h here will cancel out the h in the bottom, and we end up with the limit as h goes to 0. We have a negative 2 on top. And in the bottom, we have the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2 plus the square root of 2a plus 2h plus 2. Okay, so I know it seems kind of complicated, but the last step is very simple. You are going to take h equals 0 and plug it in here and plug it in here. And when you plug those in, this is going to go away because when h equals 0, you get nothing there. And so this becomes the square root of 2a plus 2. This is the square root of 2a plus 2. And this becomes the square root of 2a plus 2. So what you get is the following. 
Now, the square root of 2a plus 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2 is 2a plus 2. And the square root of 2a plus 2 plus the square root of 2a plus 2 is 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2. So we are multiplying those together. And I can get rid of my limit. I apologize for that because I already let h equal 0, so that doesn't need to be there anymore. And now my final answer is I get negative 2 over... 2a plus 2, okay, so that is this part, and then multiplied by 2 times the square root of 2a plus 2. And there's one more thing we can do here. This 2 and this 2 are going to cancel out, and we get negative 1 over 2a plus 2 to the first power and 2a plus 2 to the 1 half power. And those can be combined to be 2a plus 2 to the 3 halves power. All I'm doing there is adding these powers together. And there is my f prime of a. Now remember the last part was they wanted us to find f prime of a and they told us a equals 1. So f prime of 1 is negative 1 over 2 times 1 plus 2 to the 3 halves. And this is negative 1 over 4 to the 3 halves. So what is 4 to the 3 halves? So 4 to the 3 halves, remember that means the square root of 4 cubed. And that is 2 cubed, which is 8. So this can be rewritten as negative 1 8. So to summarize just a little bit, we know that the tangent line to y equals f of x at the point a, f of a, is the line through that point whose slope is equal to f prime of a, which we call the derivative of f at a. If we use the point-slope form of the equation of the line, we can write this equation in this form. So that just comes from y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, but the slope is f prime of a, y1 is f of a, and x1 is a. Now, you can also solve for y and get f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. This is another way to express the equation of a tangent line. And one final thing I'll mention here is when you have a function and you're looking at the slope of a secant line, you can view the rise here as the change in y and the run here as the change in x. So the slope of that secant line can be viewed as delta y divided by delta x. So the triangle there is delta. And delta means change. So if I want the slope of the secant line, the, excuse me, the slope of the tangent line, which represents the instantaneous rate of change, I can take the limit as delta x approaches 0 of delta y divided by delta x. Now again, delta x is this distance, which earlier in this section we had been calling this h, right? So this is just a different kind of notation that we could use. And delta y is f of x2 minus f of x1, and delta x is x2 minus x1. So when delta x approaches 0, it's the same as saying x2 is approaching x1. So I don't want anybody to get confused by this. This is just another way to give the notation for the slope of a tangent line. And the last thing to say here is the derivative f prime of a, which is the slope of the tangent line, is also representative of the instantaneous rate of change of y equals f of x with respect to the variable x when x equals a. So think of f prime of a as the slope of the tangent line and also the instantaneous rate of change. And that concludes this lesson.